Welcome to Motorsport on 4 from Donington in the very heart of England, just off the M1 in Leicestershire. We're here for the British Formula 3 and GT Championships. And despite the clouds, we're hoping that the weather is not going to do the same to us as it did at Snetterton. We're going to start the programme though by taking a look back at the Formula 3 Championship so far. This is the old hairpin. Back in the 30s it was a real hairpin and very tight, but now it's a fourth gear, 100, 110 mile an hour bend, which is crucial for the driver to get absolutely right. The reason? Well it follows a flat out section in the Formula 3 car down the Craner curve, and the exit is uphill and flat out again for another half mile. It's my favourite corner on the circuit, but let's see how it fits in with a complete lap. We're on board with Jimmy Bruni in last year's Fortec F3 car for a flying lap of Donington Circuit. Up through the gears across the start-finish line, he's focused on Redgate Bend and a perfect entry to the first corner. He can take it wide and carry as much speed out as possible onto the next flat-out section. Out over the rumble strips, he's up through the gears and down the Craner curves, which in the GT car is a bit of a handful, but for Jimmy, let's see if he's flat. Perfect. And down to the old hairpin, the corner we talked about earlier, he's carrying really good speed on the exit to the uphill section to McLean. Under Starkey's bridge, approaching McLean's, you've got to break round the bend, the driver's worst nightmare. But he gets it perfect and clips the apex where there's a little bump just there, and then lets the car drift out, again going uphill towards Coppice. It's a blind apex just there, and he's clipped it perfectly and carrying the speed out as much as possible onto the straight. Here the GT car that I drive is a little bit quicker than F3, maxing out at about 155 miles an hour. Braking ever so hard down to Fogarty's chicane, clattering over the curves on the left and early on the power for a good exit. Approaching Melbourne, he's looking to see if anyone's trying to pass him or if he can pass anyone else because it's a real heavy break down to this tight, tight hairpin. Getting a late apex and being careful not to let the car oversteer, he gets good traction up the hill towards the final corner and let's not spoil the lap Jimmy at the hairpin. Very difficult to see the apex on the left but he gets it just right and powers his way out with a little twitch of oversteer there across the start finish line. Qualifying in Formula 3 has always been important. This year it's also been unpredictable. At Donington the front runners all struggled early on but finally, joint series leader Derek Hayes claimed third place behind Takuma Sato. If it's conditions like this, you have to think more position on the circuit where you want to be and get the lap time in. As when it's completely dry, it's just, you can drive round and round and round for like four or five laps. So do you think therefore you've actually just made the right choice, right time, and therefore you've just been very lucky? No, make your own luck. <laughs> There was a new face on pole position, German Andre Lotterer, the Jaguar driver at last on song. And uh, it's the, the best opportunity, I mean, P1, uh, I'm not too bad at doing starts, so I hope I can manage to win the race, yeah. But you've seen a lot of what Takuma Sato is capable of doing, obviously, so far this season and last year. Yeah, but it's, it's a human and it's a person like another one, so I'm a racing driver as well, so we're going to have maybe a good fight, it's good. Joint series leader Matt Davis was another to underperform during the session. He would start from 10th. We were hoping actually that it would dry up a little bit and that the conditions were drying, so we were hoping actually it would dry a little bit more. And we also had a little bit of a problem with uh, Matt's earpieces, so 
we weren't panicking at the beginning, but then it sort of looked like rain, so we did panic and we got out and we didn't really get a lap in. In the scholarship class, Brazil's Inani Judith claimed his first pole position of the season. Yeah, very happy. Uh, it's a very important year for me. It's my first year here in England. It was my first time on the track. And it's a learning year and it's very good to have pole. It's just even before than I expected, so it's great. The car was perfect. And Andre Lotterer has the honour of claiming Jaguar's first ever single-seater racing car pole position. Takuma Sato starts alongside him, ahead of Derek Hayes and Jan Maria Bruni, with Spence and Edwards on row three, but no previous winners in the top half dozen. Parker Racing's Inani Judith claims pole position in the scholarship class, but the championship leader Matt Gilmore back in 10th place. So here I am at the transitional point in the grid between the championship and the scholarship classes. Anani Judas here is in pole position for the scholarship. That means the guys in front don't matter, but the guys behind do. It's over to Martin and Ben. Thanks, Amanda. There's great excitement for Jaguar here today. First pole position for them this year, a little better than they're doing in Formula One. And I'm sure the Formula Three boys will be very keen on rubbing that in in the factory as well. Well, after the aerial entertainment, on with the main attraction. 32 cars on the grid running all the way round through Goddard's. But Andre Lotterer concentrating on pole. We're on board with Derek Hayes in third place. Watch the lights, away they go. That was a very quick change. Lotterer off like a shot from the gun. Very good start indeed, and there's someone stalled at the back. Yeah, it's Nicholas Chiesa. Chiesa has been left on the grid, so no good news for the Dane here at Donington. On board with Matt Davis taking the wide line around the outside, always a little bit of a gamble oh. because you get run off onto the dirt. <laughs> Very wide there, wasn't he, Martin? He was right out over the curb, and look how many places he's lost. Well, that's a dreadful getaway for Matt Davis. The outside line is always a gamble, and he lost, and even his teammate there going past him on the outside. Well, slippery on the curbs down at the old hairpin, they'll have to be careful of that, but Andre Lotter and Takuma Sato heading away. And it looks as though Lotterer may well have this one under control in the early stages already. Now we're back on board with Matt Davis, having a tough weekend so far. Qualified a long way down, made those mistakes down at Redgate. He's got Andy Prio just ahead of him as they come down towards the Fogarty chicane. Heavy, heavy braking down here. Oh, look at that. Prio's locked right up. This gives a chance to Davis to dive past him. Oh, no. Prio's still just got it. Well, he did well to hold on to the position. Matt Davis tried everything but couldn't get through. And there is Matt, the first of the two orange cars, looking back for the scholarship leader. There is the blue car, Michael Cohan. Oops! That's Robert Dernbos, right over the top of the pole position man, Imani Judas. Meanwhile, we're back with Anthony Davidson, and he was in eighth, trying to get seventh place away from Jeffrey Jones, and that was a good move up the inside into Goddard. Jamie Spence is the car ahead of him now. Well, the leader's just starting the seven lap, and further back, that's Stuart King and Partiva Surishwaran underneath him, the Indian driver. Well, what is it, mating Formula 3 cars? I'm not sure that's in the rules anywhere. Robert Dornbos on the curbs, they can't rock him clear. I'm sure his car will be too badly damaged to continue anyway. Jeffrey Jones on the way up through McLean, just uh, locking brakes slightly. We heard from Tim Harvey that it's easily done at that part of the track. Now up towards Coppice and onto the longest straight here at Donington where they head down towards that Fogarty chicane and a possible late braking manoeuvre. Here in the top two, Andre Lotterer and Takuma Sato. Uh, oh, that's Adam Blair, the scholarship class driver, off in the gravel. That's at Coppice, he was well up in the field. And with all those damaged cars, Ben, the safety car coming out, no surprises there. No, that's right, the leaders have slowed the pace down. Oh, DL's moved out of line there. I don't know. Oh, and Andy Prio's on the grass in the midfield there. I think they've built, they're all still racing. Hopefully they've slowed themselves down and they can retake their positions. Now, let's just take another look at what happened between the scholarship cars. Michael Kiahan was leading. Now, he did actually get hit by Anani Judith. Ah, and that slowed him down. That's really why he was then <laughs> vaulted by Robert Dornbos, who those two were the ones in trouble. But in fact, there was some contact with the class leader, Michael Kiahan. Well, one lap later, the lights off on the pace car. They're getting ready to go racing again. And can Lotra make a good start here? Takuma Sato, we've seen from previous races, a great overtaker, blinding in the wet weather at Donington Park at this meeting last year, but unable to find a way past Lotra on the first lap. Away they go then together. And Bruni down in third should have been closer. So should Derek Hayes. Now we're on board with Derek Hayes. Fourth place, and he's coming through the crane of curves. Listen flat out through there that's the way it should be as tim harvey told us earlier in the program you've got to keep your foot to the floor on the throttle through there and that's exactly what derek hayes is doing in fourth 
but the lead pair have already got another advantage after the restart they jumped away the midfield battle is going to be very tight though on board with anthony davidson coming up to the pair of blind right handers that lead onto the fast back straight and then another really tricky place for drivers to get it all right yeah concentration great view of anthony davidson at work here and total concentration as he extracts the maximum from this formula 3 car there is Trevor Carlin, he's the boss of uh, Anthony Davidson's Carlin Motorsport car, also running Takuma Sato, and here is Sato inside Andre Lotterer having a little look, didn't get close enough to actually make the move stick, so Lotterer still holds on, but Sato is very close indeed, Ben, ideally placed to try something soon. He is, coming down to Redgate, you saw him take a little look, a little think about outbreaking Lotterer, but just held back for the moment, I think he's looking for his opportunity. And there's the race leader's team boss, Bruce Jenkins, watching closely. He's worried about Sato and his presence in Lotterer's mirrors. Sato kicking up the dust out of the old hairpin. He's got a run on Andre Lotterer as well. He's looking to the inside. Now, can he make something of this at McLean's? Well, he's going to have to go around the outside there, but Lotterer really feeling the pressure and up to Coppers. Surely Sato has the inside line. He's got command of the racetrack into the double right-hander. He gets ahead. Now, can Lotterer take it back? Well, we'll have to see, Martin, but Sato judged that beautifully. It all started out at the old hairpin when Lotra made the little mistake. And in fact, look, watch out for Jimmy Bruni in third because he's right up with these top two now. Sort of because they've slowed each other down a little bit, he's got an opportunity. Let's take a look at the replay. Sato up on the outside. Now, Lotra has to go in very tight into McLean. That compromises his entry speed. He's slow at this part of the corner and runs out wide. Sato, on the other hand, he's able to cut back to the inside with that wide approach that he took. Now he has the inside line as they come up the hill, under braking, that allowed him to take the place. Michael Kohan leading the scholarship class. Five minutes left of the race to go. Mark Mayles in second, ahead of Justin Sherwood. There's Peter Nielsen, Robbie Kerr, Matt Gilmore, the points leader coming to Donington Park. And he's having a bit of a tough time there in sixth place. Robbie Kerr in the middle of that little group, four, fifth and sixth. Desperate to try and keep Gilmore behind him. That's important for him in the championship. But mud on the car. He's been off somewhere, hasn't he? Yeah, he's had an exciting time somewhere. We're watching Anthony Davidson now. He's in seventh place, breaking into the Fogarty chicane. Still just behind the green car there of Jamie Spence. Good battle going on between these cars. And we're back on board with Anthony Davidson coming down to the Melbourne hairpin. Has a little think about going down the inside here. Oh, there's a bit of contact for between him and Jamie Spence, but they both managed to hold it together. Now they're almost side by side again as they head up towards Goddard. Spence tries to hold the inside, defend that inside line. Anthony trying to go all the way around the outside. That's brave here at Goddard. There's not a lot of space on the exit, and he doesn't quite make it. Still tucked into the slipstream as they head down towards Redgate. Another overtaking opportunity here. There's no doubt about it, but Spence has got the inside. Oh, the two of them almost wheel banging, almost into the pit lane exit as they came down into Redgate. Spence still has the place and it's the final lap so everybody will be trying to pick up places Robbie Kerr's out though he pulls off within sight of the flag almost Spence still holding off Davidson now can Davidson do what Takuma Sato did to Andre Lotterer in the other green car let's have a look well he's not quite as close but look Spence makes a big mistake he was well wide of the apex over the curb on exit now he's right alongside on the grass trying to get past here he comes on the outside of Coppice, bit of contact again, he slides, and now diving through on the inside goes Jones, so he's managed to gain the place. James Courtney also going past, and because Davidson and Spence got together there at Coppice, Davidson has ended up losing out. And around the outside comes James Courtney as well, so those two very brave indeed going into Coppice, but in the end paying the price. Now instead of picking up one place, Davidson has lost one, effectively gone further down the order. James Courtney gets up two places, and I don't think in the last couple of corners Davidson's going to have much of an answer for that, but he's right with him. And meanwhile, Takuma Sato, his teammate, comes out of the final corner, a second and a half ahead of Andre Lotterer to win his first race in 2001. The Carlin team now looking back for Anthony Davidson. There is Courtney up from 11th oh. to 7th, and he's hit him. He's been hit, he's been hit, but by whom? That's the question, because Courtney was ahead. Oh, it's Spence, look, the green car. Those two made contact again on the final corner. Well, the team applauding a brave drive as well. They should have. Michael Johan's team will be applauding him as well. He takes the scholarship class victory after a strong race to recuperate from a poor qualifying. But it's win number one for the pre-season favourite Takuma Sato. And looking back then, it 
exactly as you said, Jamie Spence taking the final look down the inside and the pair of them power sliding out towards the flag. Fantastic stuff. A comfortable win for Takuma Sato, likewise for Michael Kohan in the scholarship class. First win for this season. I was always a good position in the qualifier, but lots of bad luck and um, but it's finally, you know, I wanted to be really, really happy. Yeah, you know, it's been brilliant to have this win today. And 21st birthday. Yeah, yeah, super. It makes everything just really good. We'll find out if he can make it a double winning weekend in a couple of minutes in Motorsport on 4. <laughs> Welcome back to Donington Park and qualifying for round six of the British Formula 3 Championship where rain once again influenced proceedings, catching out even some of the best. After the heavy shower, the circuit dried enough for everyone to change to slicks. And when it did so, Silverstone race winner James Courtney gave himself a better chance of a good result with sixth on the grid. Derek Hayes was Mr. Consistent again, but he was bumped right at the end by Takuma Sato and by Matt Davis. The unfortunate thing in, in a session like that is that the later you leave it, the worse the tyres are. And the mine had gone up a little bit by then, but I'm on the front row, so it's better than this morning anyway. But nobody could hold a candle to Andre Lotterer, the Jaguar driver, secure on pole position for the final 10 minutes of the session. Will Lotterer's second consecutive pole position yield a victory? We'll have to wait and see. Behind him, Matt Davis just six one thousandths of a second ahead of Takuma Sato. Derek Hayes in fourth, Anthony Davidson in fifth, and James Courtney in sixth position. The scholarship class headed away by Matt Gilmore, Robbie Kerr in second place behind him, and round five winner Michael Kyohan in third. So for the first time this season, we've got the same driver on pole position for both Formula 3 races, the German driver Andrea Lotterer. But if you remember back to the first race earlier on, he was overtaken by Takuma Sato. And for this race, Takuma is right behind him. Stand by for action. Yes, indeed, stand by. Fasten your seatbelts, and if you're seated comfortably, then we'll begin. It's a bright, cool day at Donington Park. Look at Matt Davis on the grid, lined up directly aiming at the outside line. Away they go, Andre Lotter starts well, and James Courtney swung around the outside there to try and put himself up the grid. But Davis is trying to fight off Takuma Sato down the inside. Is Sato still there? Yes, he is! John Jett between them. Off into the gravel goes Matt Davis. Somebody's taken his nose off as well, so he's been hit a second time. He rejoins, but surely headed for the pits. That's Mark Mayle, the scholarship runner who spun as well. There's James Courtney in the Jaguar. He's second now. That means Sato and Davidson have both gone off. Hayes, then DL, and the rest of the field coming through. Takuma Sato there further back, and he's got no rear wing on his car now. How on earth did that happen? Leaders coming up through Coppice and McLean's, and further back, oh, more contact! Well, Sato, surely his race must be over. I can't imagine they'll fix that in time for him to continue then. No, there's no way they can put a new rear wing on. In fact, they're preparing a front wing by the looks of things, so that's not going to do him any good at all. They've got to change the rear wing. It's a long job. He won't be able to get a good result. End of lap one then, and Courtney's still in second place. Andre Lotterer, the Jaguar driver, leads from James Courtney, the other Jaguar driver. Jamie Spence again in the middle of the action there, out of the final corner. He does like that as an overtaking position. Bits of debris uncertain will be lying on the track there. But meanwhile, Takuma Sato comes into the pits and surely into retirement, followed by Matt Davis. Well, what a disappointment. Takuma Sato winning that first race, but it's all over effectively in this second race. Matt Davis goes past. He came into this meeting as championship leader, of course, Matt Davis. Bad news for both of these two. Oh, and it looks as though there's a problem with the gearbox. There's no way they can even put a new rear wing on. It's all over. You can see the casting broken. Let's take another look from on board Anthony Davidson's car. Now, he started fifth on the grid. We might get a better view of what happened between these two. There's Sato on the far right of the picture, trying to get down the inside into Redgate corner. Now, Matt Davis on the outside there, giving Sato a bit of room, but Sato slides into it. So Sato hits Davis, and Davidson in into the back of Sato and takes his rear wing off. And Amanda is down in the pits now with Takuma Sato. Two cross into the first corner, Matt Davis. Um, I was inside completely, and he didn't give me any any um, room at all. He uh, was coming down the inside, not fully down the inside, but I got. I think I broke a lot later than him going to the corner. And I, I thought he'd disappeared, actually. I thought he'd uh, given up trying to overtake me there. We got halfway around the corner, and he caught my back wheel, spun me around. 
Well, a classic first corner action, really, but I think Sato could have done a little more to have avoided oh, it. Oh, there, Nicholas Chiesa spinning across the curbs there. Seems to have recovered. Oh, no, Jamie Spence trying to go around another car. Hits and side on. I don't think he was expecting that Chiesa would have recovered quite so quickly. Poor Nicholas is out. There is Jamie Spence. The yellow car is Bruce trying to come around him. He's got Jeffrey Jones slipping around at the back as well. Oh, Jamie really is in the wars at the moment. And look at that, Jones. He really is opportunist here at Donington Park. Picks up two places as the cars ahead of him squabble. Spence goes down two there. Well, what looked like a really good overtaking chance three quarters ago has really backfired on him. That was a classic incident of how you slow each other up trying to go through a corner side by side and Jones took advantage. Here comes Spence again down the inside of Juani. Oh, and they make contact. We've got more contact here. Juani off the road. Spence is also off. I think there could be damage to both cars there certainly for Spence's front suspension. Look at that, the right front is totally deranged. He's out of it. Giovanni might be able to get back in. Andre Lotterer leads for Jaguar. James Courtney in second place for Jaguar. Well, Courtney took the honour of Jaguar's first ever single-seater win at Silverstone. First ever single-seater pole goes to the German driver here at Donington Park, where we now see a Jaguar 1-2 win. Certainly here, there doesn't seem much to stop it. We're looking at the Chiesa's accident. Well, he'd already spun at this point, but watch Jamie Spence coming past and doesn't allow for where Chiesa is on the road. Just clouds that front wheel. A strange accident, that one. You don't normally see that. I think Jamie just didn't realise exactly where Chiesa was on the track. Well, all of this drama absolutely immaterial to Andre Lotterer from pole position safely into the first corner. Now he sees the chequered flag. Jaguar delighted with their first ever single-seater one-two result in the company's history. And just look at Andre Lotterer. Scholarship class winner will be Robbie Kerr, three seconds ahead of Michael Kyohan and Matt Gilmore. And let's go down and join the Jaguar team. Ruth, well, you are doing better than the Formula One team. Yeah, but they'll improve. They'll come on in time. I mean, that's a fantastic achievement for us today. And also for Jaguar as well in supporting the Formula Three. It just goes to show the depth of the British Formula 3 this year. I mean, any one of 10 guys can win a race. I mean, first and second, what more can I say? I'm so proud of all my guys. A wonderful weekend for Jaguar. Lotterer taking his first victory. James Courtney right behind him. And Derek Hayes, the best of the rest, a long way back in third. Robbie Kerr, the scholarship winner. Birthday board Kyohan doesn't make it two out of two at Donington. Fantastic, yeah. Jeez. It's also nice for the team to finish second, one and two. It's the dream result for the whole team, so uh, it's great. My car was fantastic. I could drive every lap at the same time. It was hard not to battle with the A-class guys, but um, they're in a separate race to us, so we just got to finish, and we did, so we got the point. Derek Hayes still leads the championship from James Courtney and Jan Maria Bruni, but double race winner Matt Davis slips down to fifth position. Matt Gilmore has led the scholarship class since race one, but with 20 races left to go, it's still wide open. Ben, what about your thoughts on Donington then? Well, Martin, it's still very early in the championship, but to win a title, you have to be consistent. Let's take a look at some of the front runners. Pre-season favourite, Takuma Sato. His qualifying performances so far this year have been very, very strong. But if you then take a look at his race performances, apart from that one win and a second place, he's had some varying results from two non-finishes which means he's further down in the points. If we look at Matt Davis and Derek Hayes next, they were joint leaders of the championship coming into this last race. Matt's qualified up and down, and the same with the race results. Some good results, some poor results, that's not the way to keep on racking up the points. The joint championship leader with him before Donington, Derek Hayes, slightly different with him. Look at those qualifying performances. They've been very consistent after the first race, and most notably, look at the race results. Most of them have been on the podium. He's always been in the top four. But for the Formula One team managers who are watching F3, will it be the consistency of Hayes or the blinding speed of this man, Takuma Sato, that will count? Only time will tell. So a fantastic race for the Formula 3. A dream result for Jaguar and our two pre-season favourites, Takuma Sato and Michael Kiahana, both managed to have a victory. Well, now it's time for GTs and a quick look back at their season so far.
Kelvin Berth has already made a major impact in GT racing, but I remember him in his first season, 1987, when we competed against each other in Formula First. On pole position, I broke a drive shaft in that first race, while Kelvin led until Eugene O'Brien passed him. It was a fun year. Good, good learning year. A lot of accidents, a lot of traffic out there, a lot of learners, a lot of novice drivers, but uh, we came through it in the end. After that season of Formula First, Kelvin spent two years in Formula Ford, where he came up against a certain David Coulthard. David had a fantastic season, his debut year, and uh, he and I dominated the year, but I'd, it would be unfair of me to say that we were equal. He, to be fair, he dominated the year and won most of the races. Moving to Formula Vauxhall, Lotus brought further clashes with David Coulthard, but he won the title the following year with nine wins. Graduating to Formula Three brought greater satisfaction. I love the cars, they're really the most rewarding cars for a driver to drive, I love Formula 3 cars, they're, they're so precise and so, it's the car that you can get nearest to perfect in terms of setup. With Paul Stewart racing for his second year, he won the 93 title, again taking nine victories, despite changing from a Reynard chassis mid-season. First race we got the Dallara, I got pole in a victory and more often than not from then on we won. I, I don't remember many races after we got the Dallara that we didn't win, so uh, no, it was a very, very strong season. Kelvin was without doubt probably one of the, the greatest characters that we've had through our doors. He's just such a personal guy. He's, he, if a gust of wind sort of blew on him, he'd blow over. He's that laid back. Um, nothing, so, nothing fazed him. And he just sort of brought a tremendous amount of fun to the team. Maybe it was that laid-back attitude that stopped him reaching Formula One, despite beating the likes of Pedro de la Rosa in third place here behind Kelvin. I think that's maybe a fair criticism. It's a very, very cutthroat world, and uh, you learn as you go along. You know, I was maybe a little bit naive at that sort of level to start with. I know for sure I've got the ability in the car, but you need more than that in Formula One. Pit stops are a crucial part of GT racing. Unlike Formula One, we have to change drivers. I have to undo these belts, get underneath the bar. Bobby has to come in under the bar, and the mechanics then fix the belts together. Zoom above the pit lane and try and get us back in position where we were. Let's see how we go on with the practice run. OK, as we come down the pit lane, just looking for the inboard, keeping the miles to exactly how we should be. Turn into the pit board, onto the brakes, keep the car out of gear, and as soon as it comes to a hole, then release the belts. Belts out, cross out, that's it. Basically, Bobby needs his actual radio plugs in now. So I put the radio in, as you can see, Cushy's still at the front, Boomy's bloke putting down the belt, just making sure everything's okay. Bobby selects first gear. Well, that was quite a good pit stop, under 16 seconds. But let's take a look at some of the things that can actually go wrong. First, the speed limit. 60 kilometres per hour or 37 miles per hour is pretty slow, but it's for safety reasons. Go fast in the pit lane and you incur a big penalty. Then there are the bells. Dave Welch struggled for the bells to be done up in the last round at Snetterton. The steward wouldn't let him leave until everything was tight and teammate Callum Lockie had to help out. Then there's the orange square on the side of the car that indicates to the officials and spectators that the car hadn't yet stopped. Forget to remove it and you have to stop again. The door. One of our favourites. Make sure it's closed. At least once a year somebody loses a race because of this. At one round it was our turn. And finally, don't stall. We've done that too. Pit stops were the least of Michael Caine's worries in qualifying. The TVR was back in 13th with tyre problems. List, of course, wasn't helped by a spin at Goddard's. They ended up a second down, but it was Tim Harvey who planted the Hales Viper on pole and was never challenged. Uh, all you can do is get your head down and find, you know, when the tyres get up to temperature, make sure you bang in a good lap. But the track was sort of dry on one half and wet on the other, so that made it iffy as well. But, you know, the other GT runners were in disarray. Callum Lockie was sharing with Dave Veltz again, but qualified down in 15th. The Quaife was going well until Mick Quaife thumped the concrete wall at the Melbourne hairpin. And the sole Marcus Mantara destroyed its chances with a damaging off in the wet as well. In the GTOs, Martin Short's TVR Cerbera grabbed the second place on the drying track, while Kelvin Burt claimed his first GTO pole. 
Wow! Kelvin, that was mega! Wow, I, don't, I haven't seen the times. I, don't, I know we're quickest, but I don't know by much or whether it was close or what it was. Well, the point was you're actually quickest overall for uh, quite a bit of the session. Yeah, good, good. The Piper on pole position then from the list of Storm. The TBR Speed 12s in third and fifth place on the grid. Between them, the Quake and the reigning champions, Forger, down in 15th spot on the starting lineup. Frankie Gilbert head the Porsche Hordes in GTO, but breaking up the German domination, Short and Bath TBR and the Bland and Vander end the Marcos. Welcome back to Motorsport on 4 for the British GT Championship from Donington Park and ready to go for 60 minutes of hectic action for round 3, including those all-important pit stops that Michael Caine was talking about earlier. Rob Wilson's Viper is on pole, Dave Warnock alongside in the lister. The lights go green, Rob Wilson nails it immediately to jump into the lead. The white car in the second row is Kelvin Burt, Rob Barth in the Speed 6, trying to go around the outside of him as the Speed 12 also tries to make up a position. We're on board in the middle of Redgate with the champion, Callum Lockie. Oh, a touch there with Michael Caine and Bobby Bird and Rose TBR Speed 12. But they both survived as Rob Wilson leads them down into the old hairpin for the first time. And Ben, Rob's already got a good advantage. Yes, he has. Don't forget, these are big, heavy cars, Martin, full of fuel on cold tyres. Not easy to drive on the first lap of these 60-minute races. But Rob Wilson got away beautifully and already opening up a little bit of an advantage in the Viper with Dave Warnock right behind, and look at Kelvin Burt, he's flying once again in that GTO Porsche. Oh, and further back, Mick Quaid gets pushed off, and that's Jackie Van der Ender, the Dutchman in the Marcus, who's colliding with him, and I think they're both out. On board now with Dave Warnock, leader Rob Wilson ahead, down at the end of the straight, through Fogarty Chicane, and he's trying to stay with the Viper. And this is David Jones going down the inside of Ed Horner in the orange car, that's for 11th place. Oh, a little contact there as they came back out. And now we're on board with Callum Lockie as he heads down towards Melbourne Hairpin. Look at all that smoke coming out of that is Ed Horner's car. So there was that bit of contact at the previous corner. Callum's trying to get down the inside of him. Well, they make contact. Round goes Horner and his problems multiply. Callum Lockie is still in it. And he's charging after the leaders, the Viper, the Lister, the Porsche in third. Then the TVRs, the Speed 12 and the Speed 6 ahead of Sean Valve's Porsche. But the lead is starting to ease away now, and Kelvin Burt staying with them in the GTO class Porsche, doing a great job. Now, Ben, I think this is, yeah, water pouring out of the nose-mounted radiators of Ed Horner's car, and he's spinning on his own liquids there. Yes, that's right. The bad news for Ed Horner. It looks as though that's fairly terminal, I have to say. The car's not going to be able to run much longer with that amount of fluid pouring out. The leaders uh, coming up through Swans Curve, out of Old Hairpin, very fast section of the track. This look, Horner's still trying to continue round, I think that really that's a bit of a mistake. Look at the amount of fluids coming out. I suppose he can't see that, but I'm sure that he can see all that steam and everyone else certainly can. Well, the yellow flags are out here at Coppice, of course, from that first corner crash. Let's have a look back, though, and see if we can pick up where the action started. So we're riding with Callum Lockie. got the black TVR ahead, and then the blue Marcos just ahead of that. That's Jackie Van der Ender, who gets involved in the instant. Well, he gets off the tarmac on the grass, comes back onto the tarmac and takes out poor old Mike Quaid who was entirely innocent in all of that. I don't know what Van der Ender was doing on the grass there, very bizarre. On board again with Callum Lockie, big, big slide as he gives it a huge bootful over the curb, just holds on, but you don't need to offer a chance like that to David Jones twice. He slides by, back to change the tenth place. But look at this, Callum back down the inside. The champion is really fighting hard and thoroughly enjoying himself, I'm sure, in this Porsche. Didn't qualify well, but my goodness, he's picking up places in the race and in the pits, Shane Lynch from Boyzone and water and steam pouring out of the front of his Marcus. Don't think they're going to be able to fix that one somehow. Meanwhile, Rob Wilson is still... Oh, look at Dave Warnock. Dave Warnock in second place has gone off at the old hairpin. Slides wide onto the grass. He's kept it rolling. The other cars coming around now have to try and avoid this stricken lifter that's sitting across the track. And he's got to get it running again. He's still got the engine running. We're on board with him now. And he is trying to get back in the race. Look at all that power, 600 brake horsepower on grass. Oh, it's so difficult to get it going again. And it's so wet and muddy, there's no traction there. Now, let's take a look at this on replay, Martin. He's heading down to the old hairpin. 
listen. Oh, well, amazing that. He he turned in normal sort of speed, trying to get back on the power, and the thing just swapped ends on him. I would say that it may well be slippery down there. It looks to me as though it is. It could, of course, be the fluid from Ed Horner's Porsche that's causing a problem. Bobby Burton rose black, TDR speed 12, passes the white version of Ashley Ward. When Ward looks fun, Ward was in fact ahead of the white Porsche of Kelvin Burt. And he's dropped back now. Bobby Burton rose got past him as well. And as Burton Rowe accelerates away, chasing and now looking for second place. On board with Callum Lockie. And there's the white TBR going very slowly and being passed by the GTO cars as well. Ben, it looks as though he's got a problem. Yes, it does. We've only had three laps of this race, Martin. Very early for Ashley Ward to be in trouble, but it looks fairly terminal. Back on board with Callum Lockie, and he's trying to take another position. Getting past Simmons into Redgate. Just a clean piece of outbreaking, no problem. Ashley makes it back to his pit. Well, that may be the last we see of that car. It's going very slowly indeed. No problem so yet for Rob Wilson in the Viper. In tail end of traffic, a trio of Marcus Mantises. He's dealt with Charlotte Osborne, Jeff Wyatt right ahead of him, and then David Dove will be the next one. And look at the way he just weaves through the field, using his horsepower advantage to great effect. Of course, the lighter Mantises can break nicely, but uh, Dove kicking up the dust there, and he spins it in front of the leader. I was going to say, he looks very wide through Goddard there. David Dove now trying to get himself pointing in the right direction. Went very wide into the corner. I think perhaps he just got a little bit distracted by having the race leader coming up to lap him. Always the problem with the slower cars, what they're going to do when you get there. But Rob Wilson survived that one. On board replay, exactly right, Ben. Just too wide down the hill. Oh, <laughs> heart in the mouth moment there for Rob, I think. Well, let's take a look at the battle for a second now. Bobby Burton Rowe, he's got a, a bit of bodywork there on the side. The balance is flapping around in the wind. Callum Lockie trying to take that second place. We're on board with the reigning champion in his Porsche. Gets down the inside into Melbourne from a long way back. Now, Bobby Burton Rowe breaks very, very early there. We are coming up towards the pit stop. Seems strange, though. Well, Amanda's in the TVR pit, so let's hear from Michael Kane. Oh, um, he's in this lap. We've got no brakes. Oh. So uh, the foot, the, we've got a pedal to the floor, so uh, no, we're struggling. Well, it's no doubt that this Donington circuit is notoriously hard on the brakes, Martin. They're braking from very high speeds at several places, going into the Fogarty S's and the Melbourne Heaven. Coming into the pits then, we've got the leader and that's the Bobby Verdon Road TVR. Well, Rob Wilson falls in with what looks like a very healthy Viper. Tim Harvey ready to get in. They will have to take the orange stickers off the door, of course, to allow everybody to know that the change has been made. And, oh, wouldn't want to be standing in front of that TBR knowing it's got no brakes. That's a very worrying time indeed for the team. Question is, Ben, what can they do about it in such a short time? Pretty much nothing, I Well, imagine. there's not a lot you can do. No, you can't start taking wheels off and uh, changing pads. you just got to get your new driver in. That's Tim Harvey has got into the Rob Wilson car. So he just about gets out ahead as the lister comes into the pits. And that was interesting as the lister of Dave Warner comes into the pits to hand over to Mike. Joins then, he'll be in third place. Bobby Verdenro rejoins, he'll be in fourth. And Mike Jordan will take over in the lister in fifth place. Now the TVR Speed 12 had a 22 second advantage at the end of the previous lap over the lister. It can't even be two seconds as they rejoin. And don't forget, having to rip away that bodywork as well as the brake problems is undoubtedly going to have slowed the Speed 12 on its way into the pits. And now Mike Jordan at full pace. And as they head down the Craner curves, knowing you've got brakes, it's a big advantage that Mike Jordan has, and I'm afraid Michael Caine certainly doesn't. No, Michael Caine, you can see, was being very cautious there on his first lap out. He knows there are no brakes in that car. He's not going to take too many silly risks. And Amanda's with his teammate, Bobby Burden rowe And then the brakes started going, so I was having to sort of dance the jig in the car, braking with my left foot on the straights, and then getting my left foot out of the way for the actual corner, and... Oh. So a spin for the lifter, brake problems for the TBR Speed 12. The only black car that's run clean so far is the Viper. Tim Harvey is in it, and of course he's the best place of those that have not yet stopped, but the race is being led by Callum Lockie in the Porsche, and in second place, Kelvin Burt. But Callum Lockie, Ben, has got a problem. Yeah, he slowed right down, didn't he, out of the Fogarty chicane. And look, you can see his head jerking around. There's a misfire. There is a, a, some sort of engine misfire problem here, and that's why he's going so slowly. It's really quite funny watching that mirror and seeing his head jerking around as the power comes in and out and I'm not sure what the problem is, it shouldn't be a fuel problem so perhaps it's some sort of electrical problem that's causing the car to misfire like that. Looks like he was leaning down trying to flick switches and there's unburnt fuel popping and banging out of the exhaust. That engine is in a very sorry state indeed. 
Now, I don't know when he was planning to stop, but I know for a fact that Callum will not go past the pitch with the car that sounds that bad. He must come in. And I wonder if the Dave Wells racing mechanics can do anything to keep him in the race. Well, Shane, he's driven superbly. Once again, they didn't qualify well, but he's been storming through the field, just as he did at Snetterton. What's he saying? Battery, battery, something wrong with the electrics. He's trying to uh, point out to the mechanics who speak German, and he has a little bit what's going on. Now, he's in the pits. He was the leader. That leaves Kelvin Burke, not only as the GTO class leader, but the overall race leader. Now, that's a fine performance. Back with Callum Lockie's car, and a new alternator belt is being fitted. So, that seems to be the cause of that electrical problem. So Kelvin Burke leading and he will do the donkey work here as long as he can stay out in the lead. I'm sure he won't want to come back into the pits. Here is the second place by for Tim Harvey, really giving it a good leathering. He knows that he's got to stay ahead of the Lister Storm. The Lister was 30 seconds back after its spin. Dave Warner could cut that to 15 by the time they were in the pits. And the gap's now stabilised around 10 or 11 seconds. So Harvey needs to keep pressing on hard. Yes, he's going past full Matfield Porsche here, but Harvey cannot afford to relax at all. He's got to get past the back markers as quickly as possible, and we've already seen that TVR have brake problems. You know, that could happen to some of these other cars too. Well, problems for the brand new Ultima. That's being pushed away. And this is Dave Belts. We're on board with Dave Belts. They finally got the engine running, but that's by push starting it. Oh dear, oh dear. And here comes the GT class leader, his direct rival, now two laps ahead. And still the Lister, well, Harvey's keeping the gap steady, but then he's really working the uh, Viper very hard indeed. And here's the car that's chasing him. Mike Jordan now aboard this Lister Storm, and they have gained important ground here. Meanwhile, of course, we saw the problems for Callum Lockie. Dave Veltz back out of that car, but Amanda's with Callum. <laughs> what was going on there? We threw an alternator belt, and by the time I came in, it was sputtering and coughing out a battery. Sounds like Callum was pushing the car himself, but in comes the race leader. Kelvin Burke hauled out. Marino Franchitti will be squished into the seat. They'll do his belts up. They check the tyre pressures. They check the tyre temperatures, the brake temperatures, double making sure that everything is safe. Bit of a long stop, but they're ready to go. Any oh, this is a long stop. Now away he goes. Marino Franchitti rejoins the race. They're still in good shape, and here we are with the man who's leading the GT class, and in fact leading overall now again, it is Tim Harvey in the Viper. As he comes up behind his teammate, now his teammate's car is actually in the GTO class, that's Ben Devlin in the other Viper, and ahead of him is Godfrey Jones in the Porsche, he's in seventh place overall. Well, no problems for Tim Harvey riding with Ben Devlin, Tim Harvey ahead of him going down the Craner curves, and a little touch on the brakes as they come through Hollywood. Now, he's got to negotiate the Porsche ahead of him as well. And he looks down the inside. Harvey braking at late and deep inside the GT3R. Gets through. And uh, Godfrey Jones got the indicator on. Was he allowing Ben Devlin to go through as well? Not a bit of it. This is a class battle for position, not being lapped by the leader. Godfrey shares the car with his twin brother, David. And they're doing a great job here. This is only their third race in the British Championship. Yeah, the indicator's still flashing, but I don't think it means anything anymore. Meanwhile, into the pits, Martin Short from third place in the GTO category. And looks as though they've got some problems. He's fiddling with the belts. They're fiddling with the gear lever as well. Well, now, Martin radioed in to say he was stuck in third gear. Looks like the mechanics have jammed it into a gear for him. So he's doing up the belts. Oh, slipping the clutch. Hopefully he's in fifth or sixth. Still got this battle between Ben Dedlitz, Devlin and Godfrey Jones. And Devlin this time has got the inside line as they head down towards the Melbourne hairpin. Nice on the brakes. Now, will the Porsche come back at him around the outside? No, he can't quite manage it. So the Norfolk youngster doing a good job in that GTO Viper. Marino Franchitti, the GTO leader, and he's slowing. He's offline at Redgate. He gets passed by Paul Matfield, who's a lap behind him. So he is definitely in strife. Here come Michael Kane in the TBR. And Tim Harvey sliding the Viper as well. They go past him and Franchitti in desperate trouble. This is really disappointing for the team of Kelvin Burton and Marino Franchitti. They've been going so well. Amanda down at the Palm Motorsport pit. Oh, Kelvin, we just heard Marino go past with a, what sounded like some sort of gearbox problem. Yeah, I, I had a few missed gears as well. It just the, the linkage didn't feel right. Uh, I didn't tell him that because we had other problems with uh, with some oversteer, so I was just telling him, advising him how to drive the car. The Viper team on the pit wall, there's Liz Rose in the shades looking very worried, and so she should be because the lifter has been reeling in the Viper at two seconds a lap for the last five laps, 
and there is Mike Jordan right on the tail of race leader Tim Harvey. Drama in the GT class. That's a big, big gap that he's closed up, so he must have a performance advantage, and we're likely to see Tim come under increasing pressure. Meanwhile, in the GTO class, Frank Kitty still struggling with that gearbox, and look, Terry Reimer's right behind him now. This is for the GTO class lead, and I think Terry Reimer's going to make an easy job of this as they go through the left-hander. Looks like Marino was stuck in a high gear, and Reimer nearly rammed him from behind. What Tim Harvey's problem is, well, he's really sliding the Viper around, Again, out of the old hairpin, having traction problems, he must be out of tyres, Ben. Yeah, he really didn't get the power down at all well there, did he? Let's watch him through Goddard now. He's quite wide in and smoking the tyres as well. He just can't hold that car on a tight line. Well, the Lister Storm is a really well set up car in dry conditions. The Viper, less perhaps than an out and out race car. Tim Harvey has got one lap left, and oh, he almost doesn't make it into Red Gate. Way from the apex, and look at that power sliding his way out. It looks great, but it's deadly slow, and it means that the lead goes on the final lap to Mike Jordan's Lister Storm. Well, the Lister looks like it's on rails, doesn't it? In comparison to the Viper, it just grips the road. Beautiful, out of the old head, a little bit of a wiggle there, but no problem. But the Viper is sliding all over the place, and what a dramatic final lap this is for the Lister Storm. Dramatic final lap as well in GTO. Terry Reimer on target now for his first race win in the GTO category. Only been racing in GTs for two years. So has Mike Jordan, last year's GTO champion. Laps Freddie Kitchens Marcus again. Just a couple of corners left, and well, if the race had been two minutes shorter, it might have been a different result, but it's never over until you see the chequered flag, as Tim Harvey knows all too well from previous experience. Mike Jordan accelerates out of the final corner. The chequered flag means Lister win for the second time in three races. Well, let's go to the Lister team and join Amanda. Now, Dave, yes. you, uh, you must have been questioning as to whether or not that was going to be possible earlier on today. Absolutely. When you sat backwards staring at the tyre wall, I thought, hmm, an iffy one, but what a great drive by Mike, fantastic drive by him. And a fantastic drive today from Terry Reimer with Adam Simmons, they win the GTO class. So let's take a look at the overall result here at Donington, and finishing third in the end was that breakless TVR, six overall with the Jones twins in their Porsche. I sort of pushed as hard as I could, trying to keep the tyres right for the end, and I thought that the pace Tim was running, he was probably really, really pushing on his tyres, and over the last five laps, the gap just came right back to me, so... That's only my second year of, mo of motor car racing, and, uh, yeah, I'll get there in the end, hopefully, but I'm really enjoying it at the moment, but thanks to Harlow again for giving me a great car. That dramatic last lap sees Mike Jordan and Dave Warnock take sole lead of the GT category after three races, champion Callum Lockie in fifth, Kelvin Burt and Marino Franchiti lead in GTO from Simmons and Reimer and the Jones Twins in third place. Another thrilling day's action from the Power Tour. You can catch them in action on Bank Holiday Monday at Alton Park in Cheshire and join us in two weeks' time for all the action in Motorsport on Four. <laughs> Next Saturday at 11, World Speedway Grand Prix.